Well, good morning. It's great to see so many people here for such an important day, on all, for all sorts of reasons, an important day. And uh, so that gives me comfort, and it makes me a little nervous. <laughs> Not as nervous as somebody else should be, but, you know, nervous nonetheless. So what I've decided to do, because, you know, I want to have a good sermon, is I'm going to throw some quotes in. Some, some quotes, because if you know much about sermons, you know that every good sermon has quotes. You quote somebody important, somebody historical, somebody, you know, from, from history. But do you know what some of the, one of the problems with some of the best quotes, or at least some of the best known quotes are? They're often not authentic. They're often not real. And, th and that even goes for some of the best known quotes in all the world. So we're, we're, I'm going to show you how this is so that, that these really well-known quotes aren't actually authentic. Uh, I'll tell you that they're not authentic, but then you're going to finish the quote for me. That's how well-known they are. Ready? So here we go. For instance, NASA astronaut Jack Swigert never said, Houston, we have problem. Never said it. Teddy Roosevelt never said, walk softly but carry a big stick. Never said it. Mark Twain never said, the only two certainty in life are death. Never said it. And Sherlock Holmes, as fictitious as he may be, never says elementary, all inauthentic. And if you've memorized those for whatever reason throughout all these years, your life has been wasted. <laughs> but, not really. Not long ago, though, I was, was kind of devastated to, to realize, to discover that one of my all-time favorite quotes, a quote from which I had gained uh, lots of encouragement, was likely never spoken by the person it was attributed to. Eric Liddell was a Scottish sprinter, rugby player, and missionary. And his experience at the Paris Olympics of 1924 is told in the blockbuster 1981 movie, Chariots of Fire. And in that movie, when he's talking about the tension between his athletic pursuits and his missionary call, Liddell says this. I believe that God made me for a purpose, for China. But he also made me fast. And when I run, I feel his pleasure. To give it up would be to hold him in contempt. To win is to honor him. Well, you know, even if Liddell never uttered these words, as he supposedly did not, still we know that they remain an accurate representation of who we know him to have been, of what he believed, and how he invested his life. And so even if they're inauthentic, I believe that these words are still able to provide me with guidance and comfort and be powerful for me as they ever were. Eric Liddell understood himself to have been made by God for a purpose. For China. And while God made him fast, and maybe even made him incredibly fast, exceptionally fast, to be fast was not his purpose. His purpose was for China. And that purpose would ultimately call for everything that he would have to offer. Because as a missionary, he was martyred in a prisoner of war camp in 1945. You know, sometimes when we talk about the Old Testament hero, Caleb, like with Liddell, we tend to focus on his, his extraordinary abilities and understand them as the most important things about him. But if we do that when we look at Caleb, we entirely miss 
the point. Because as remarkable as Caleb's abilities were, even as at his well-advanced age, and even while they may have given God pleasure, they are not the point. They are not his purpose. Caleb, too, was made for a purpose. God made, God equipped, God sent Caleb for a purpose the hill country, the hill country. So keep your Bibles open to Joshua 14, that passage from six to 14 or five to 15. I just cut it short, Matt, because I knew that when it came to uh, doing communion, you'd go long and I didn't want to do that. So we, we cut back on the scripture a bit. But in a passage loaded with meaning, I want us to focus on three things. First, that Caleb held a realistic view of the challenge. Second, that Caleb clung to the character of his God. And then third, that Caleb seized the promise of his God. For those of you who know your Bible well, you know that Caleb was one of the 12 spies that were sent out uh, ahead of time, ahead of Israel, into the promised land to get a, a survey, a, a feeling of what the land was like. And as such, Caleb has first-hand knowledge of what this land is all about. He witnessed its impressiveness, and impressed he was. Yet just as surely, and maybe contrary to the way we're often used to thinking about Caleb, he was not illusioned concerning the land. It was just as challenging as his 10 comrades had described it way back in Numbers 13. And even 45 years later, he says so. He never contradicts the 10 spies picture of the land. He says that it was rich and beautiful, but he also notes that its hills are steep. It's going to be hard to, to take. Its cities, he notes, were large and heavily fortified. And its people, the Anakites, they were giants. And Caleb admits, Caleb says, all of this. And therefore, even Caleb knew that it was going to be no pushover. And seemingly, almost because of these reasons, Caleb wants it. He seems to want it all the more. But why? Why? I mean, was Caleb looking to vindicate himself? Right after, after 45 years of comments behind the crazy old man's back, was he finally going to get a chance to show them? Is he hoping to be able to say to the children of those uh, who had now passed away, even the grandchildren, maybe even the great-grandchildren of those who had now passed away, of the bad spies, and to the rest of that generation, Ha! I told you. Or is he finally going to get the opportunity to display the power of God? Maybe that's it. Right? He'll be able to say, I don't know who your God is, but watch mine. Or maybe, just maybe, he's lathering over this opportunity because the land is simply as fabulous as the spies had said, that it actually is flowing in, in milk and honey. And for 45 long years, long, long years, he's been waiting patiently at the doorstep, longing for this moment, anticipating this opportunity. Or maybe, 
just maybe, it was little of all of them. Maybe it was little of all of them. So Caleb understood that the taking of the hill country would be a challenge. Sure. But unlike his 10 former colleagues, he also, also clearly understood that there was a world of difference between a challenge and an excuse. A world of difference between a challenge and an excuse. Well, how do we keep this difference straight? What rests at the heart of a difference between a challenge and an excuse? Well, I think the answer to this is found in the most important thing this passage of Scripture says about Caleb. And it actually, in this relatively short passage, says it three different times. Almost like my mother. Like it's trying to make a point. Like it's trying to get a message across. And contrary to what some people might think, it's not Caleb's age. And it's not his strength. And it's not his vigor. It's not his focus. It's not his dedication. And while scripture tells us some pretty impressive things about this 85-year-old man, the pivotal description that it gives us is that he is one who believed in God and put that faith into practice. He believed in God and he put that faith into practice, into action. You see, Caleb's confidence wasn't grounded in himself or in his characteristics that even today we're likely to make much of. Instead, Caleb's confidence was grounded in his God. And while Caleb knew he had work to do in taking the hill country, he knows that it will be his because God will give it to him. Caleb alone seems to understand that what he is about to receive is exactly what the scriptures call it, an inheritance. It doesn't say it's a reward. It doesn't say it's wages. It doesn't say it's plunder. It's something that God is going to give to his child. And God wasn't gonna just give him title to this land or right to this land, but God was actually going to deliver it to him. And while the 10 spies focused on the challenge before them, and therefore on their own ability to succeed, Caleb continually, both back in Numbers and even here in Joshua, brings God into the story. Even when Caleb seems to be bragging about his own fitness for battle, he couches it in the provision of God. God has seen to it that. And so it's more of a statement about who God is and what God has done than it is a statement about Caleb. But Caleb didn't just recognize this God. This scripture tells us three times that he followed his God wholeheartedly. Followed his God wholeheartedly. Really? Wholeheartedly. Hmm. And Caleb says this about himself. Well, that's a little brash, Pastor, don't you think? But this is also, you'll notice from the passage, what Moses discerned about Caleb. 
So we've gone to brash, now to impressive. Moses recognized that, and that makes it pretty impressive. But this is also what God declares to you and to me in the scriptures. And that's beyond impressive. That's, that's inconceivable. And so Caleb's boast is not just empty. He, Caleb didn't just recognize his God. Caleb just didn't know his God. He didn't just pay this God lip service. He obeyed this God. And he followed this God. He followed this God when God called on him to spy out the land. He followed this God when God called on him to testify faithfully to what he saw and to remind the people that the land was to be taken and to remind them how they were to do it. He followed when through no fault of his own, it ended up meaning he had to wait and to wait. And to wait. And he followed wholeheartedly even when he ended up having to wait 45 years. And not just 40. Like some of the others. He followed without reservation. He followed without condition. He followed without qualification. He followed with well, pause. He followed without delay. He followed without question. Caleb followed God. And so, when the time was right, Caleb, leading the people of Judah, boldly approaches Joshua. And he doesn't want to wait to see what allotment of land will fall to him. He wants the hill country. Caleb intends to hold God to his promise and intends to hold Moses to his pledge. And other tribes were assigned their inheritance by lot. But Caleb reminded Joshua that the hill country was his by divine promise and by Moses' oath. And so Caleb's leaving nothing to chance. And he wasn't about to trust Joshua's memory because he wasn't a whole, lot, a whole lot younger. The hill country, after all, was God's promise to him and was, God's, uh, was Caleb's greatest desire. Beyond that, the taking of the hill country was the very purpose for which God chose, empowered, and sent Caleb. He was made for this, literally made for this. He was born for this, selected for this, empowered for just this task. And Caleb was convinced that God had kept him alive and God had kept him strong these 45 years for the express purpose of taking the hill country, of taking the hard place, of taking the worthwhile place, of taking that place from which others shrank. And so with each passing day for 45 years, Caleb's desire for the hill country only grew and grew. Caleb resisted the tempting call of the easy way. He resisted the, 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 the tempting call of the low-hanging fruit or even of the status quo. After all, this was Caleb. He could have had any of the land that he chose. This was Caleb. But he wanted the hill country. Give me the hill country, he shouts. And he fully intends to take it. 
It's great to see uh, this place so full this morning. and such an encouragement. Well, one of the things I want to remind you, the people of Valley Alliance Church, is this. Is that you, too, are hill country people. <laughs> Almost quite literally. <laughs> but, in less literal terms... You are the chairs and heir, children and heirs. You're the children and heirs of the people who founded this thing called the Alliance. You're the children and heirs of people who founded this thing called the Canadian Midwest District. You're the children and heirs of the founders, maybe quite literally, of this very church. And all of them were hill country people. We're children of folks like a guy named A.B. Simpson, a guy named Robert Jaffrey that a few of you might have heard of, who down to their very bones were hill country people. They founded ministries, they founded movements, and they went to places that had never been tried before because it was too hard. We're children of folks in this very district like the voracious urban church planter, a guy by the name of Ernest Regeer, who didn't know he wasn't supposed to plant so many successful churches, one after another, after another, after another. The un we're, we're children of folks like Margaret Connor, uh, this young woman who would get on horseback in northwestern Saskatchewan and plant church after church after church, not realizing that young women weren't supposed to be able to do that, but did it anyway. We're children of folks like the promoters of the Encuentro con Dios movement in Peru, Eugene and Mur Muriel Kelly from Assiniboia, who planted a very strong uh, gospel witness in the country of Peru and even uh, in other places over the years. We're children of people like Ruby Johnston. Some of you might know Ruby Johnston. Just an administrative clerk at a little place called Canadian Bible College. But in her spare time, she decided to start a Bible study among the Chinese immigrants in the Regina. And from there has grown what is now about 100 churches strong called the Canadian Alliance uh, Church, uh, Chinese Churches of Canada, the CCACA. And then hundreds more after that. We're children of folks in this very district like a guy named Arnold Cook who was a missionary, a professor, and president, who, if my memory serves me correctly, might have had a role to play in the planting of this very congregation. All of these people, too, down to their very bones, were hill country people. And that makes us, that makes me, that makes you, collectively, and I hope individually, hill country people. Because we're children, in some cases this morning, maybe quite literally, of people who founded Valley Alliance Church. And these people too, down to their very bones, and some of you may actually still be here, are hill country people. You started a hard work in a hard place, and look what's happened. Look what's happened. And so I ask, therefore, adjusting the words of Caleb a little bit for us today. Are we not just as vigorous to go out to battle as they were then? The question that I think we have to ask as a denomination, as a district, as a church, and as individuals are these. Will we today follow the Lord our God wholeheartedly? Will we? Will we continue to trust our God to take the hill country, the tough places? And then can we say with Caleb that the Lord helping us, we will take it just as he said? Or have we, as the Midwest District and Valley Alliance Church, satisfied ourselves with something less than God's best. 
with something less than what God has provided for us, with something less than he may actually have made us for. And if not, and I pray not, as Joshua later in chapter 18 asked the Israelites, I ask of us, how long will we wait before we begin to take possession of the land that the Lord, the God of our fathers, has given us? How long? As we see from Caleb, there's neither rest nor retirement until we have reached, until we have inherited, until we have taken the hill country. And so again, if I can borrow from Eric Liddell in closing, I would say this. I believe that God has made us for a purpose for the hill country. But he also made us fast. And when we run, we should feel his pleasure. To give up now would be to hold him in contempt. To win is to honor him. Amen.